Hello, everyone. This is Ariel from Line Tokyo office. Today, we are honored to be hosting Taiwan Digital Minister Audrey Chang to the interview. Audrey is well known as a genius programmer as well as a charismatic politician to push Taiwan front to the next level. Audrey, welcome to the interview. Hi, uh, good local time, everyone. Uh, prior to this interview, I have conducted a survey from liners and to know what they are interested in about the, about the topics. And I think we will talk about uh, different important topics today. So many liners, they are very interested in how Taiwanese government dealing with the COVID-19 situations. So from the data till July 29th, there were more than 16,000 confirmed cases uh, globally and more than 721,000 people lost their life by this disease. And we see many countries still see this um, disease as a major threat, even after so many months. But on the other hand, uh, for a Taiwan situation, there are zero confirmed indigenous case for a continuous 108 days. Uh, this data is uh, by July 29th. And there's a Japanese survey published on July 22nd shows that Taiwan is the best out of 49 countries. And so my questions can follow. Like what were the three most uh, critical factors you think lead to Taiwan's success? And also as our audience are from different countries and they might not be familiar with Taiwanese culture and majors, uh, could you also share us about the detailed story, how you develop about the mass inventory system and also how uh, the National Health Insurance Card work, ETC? Okay, um, gladly. So um, can you see uh, the screen that I'm sharing? Would you like to put it uh, into the show? Uh, excellent. Okay. So yeah, um, I'm happy to share the Taiwan social innovation um, that was the bedrock of our counter COVID um, protocol. The idea is that we fight the pandemic uh, with no lockdown and the uh, infodemic, that's to say disinformation and panic buying and so on, and with no takedown. And the three uh, most important pillars are fast, fair, and fun, respectively. So fast means not only that we get information to people quickly, but also the quick people can very quickly surface new intelligence that's called collective intelligence from the general public into the counter pandemic effort. Indeed, in the very beginning, when many economies only countered the coronavirus begin this year, we started last year, last December, when Dr. Li Wenliang, the PRC whistleblower posted on their social media that there are seven new SARS cases, he would get eventually punishments um, harmonizing uh, his whistleblowing from his local police institution. But at the same time, the Taiwan equivalent of Reddit, the PTT board, has someone reposting that message. And it immediately get upvoted because it contains sufficient medical details uh, to warrant the attention paid to it. And so the um, very same day, uh, our health officials uh, basically said, OK, we need to start health inspection to uh, all the people <coughs> flying in from Wuhan to Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And that is the <coughs> very beginning of our uh, counter coronavirus strategy, which is at least 10 days before uh, all the other um, like World Health Organization and other countries. And so this says to me two things. First, that we can very quickly gather the collective intelligence because the civil society trusts the government enough about the freedom of speech. Indeed, according to the Civicus Monitor, Taiwan is the only society in the whole of Asia and one of the only two, if you count New Zealand uh, in the Pacific, mm -hmm. um, that has the absolute freedom of speech and this freedom of assembly, the press and so on, as any other liberal democratic country, but with the emphasis on keeping an uh, open mind to novel idea from the society. So um, as important as our Central Epidemic Command Center CCC is, I think the bedrock is this toll-free number 1922 that everybody can call and get their ideas um, escalated into, amplified into the daily press conference uh, where they not only answer all the questions from the journalist, but also surface new social innovations. For example, there was one day in April when a young boy whose family called saying that, oh, my boy doesn't want to go to school because when you ration medical mask, you don't get to pick the color. So all he had was pink medical 
Elon Musk. Now, the very next day, everybody in the CECC press conference, including Commander Chen Shizhong, started wearing pink medical mask. Uh, and even uh, Chen Shizhong even said uh, that his childhood hero uh, was Pink Panther or something like that. So making sure that people learn about gender mainstreaming, which is a such innovation. Uh, and this fast response build trust between the government and the civil society, and suddenly the boy become the most hip boy in the class because only he had the color that the heroes wear. Uh, and another focus uh, is fairness. Fairness uh, is the idea that everybody need uh, equal access to personal uh, protection equipments. And we started very early on saying that anyone who can innovate to find a better distribution method, a better um, innovation uh, that helps people to get a mask timely uh, will be rewarded essentially by uh, getting this chance at reverse procurement, meaning that they specify how we should do things and the government just takes their ideas and uh, run with it. And so um, in all the government websites uh, in Taiwan, everything ends in gov.tw, just as in uh, other domains. But in Taiwan, there's a bunch of people uh, called g0v or gov0 that just takes all the website that they don't like <laughs> and fork. <laughs> the government, uh, important pronunciation, fork, the government. Uh, fork means to take what we had, but uh, taking it to a different direction. And in this new direction, of course, it's all open source, means uh, that the copyright uh, is mostly relinquished so that the government can very quickly then take it into account. So on join the G0V.TW community at any given time, there's hundreds of people just working on the counter COVID, trying to imagine new ways, for example, for the medical mass distribution that makes it much more visible and accountable than the system. So this is, uh, the first uh, version of the uh, medical mask di distribution map, and this is done by uh, Howard Wu or Wu Jiangwei from Tainan City. Um, and at the very beginning, I think it was very early April, uh, when we were still rationing the mask, but with no real name purchasing system, the main issue was that people would run to maybe five different convenience stores, uh, and they didn't know which convenience stores still have mask in stock and which doesn't. Um, and when the pharmacies uh, start selling the medical mask, uh, exactly the same thing is happening. And so this is why uh, the Howard Wu saw uh, there's a lot of people uh, using the platform called Line. You may have heard of it um, in the uh, family group to share uh, information such as, oh, I'm here uh, and it's run out of mask. And I'm here, uh, it still have some mask and so on. But Line, um, to be, uh, with all due respect, is not the best uh, uh, way to organize this information <laughs> um, with very limited uh, search and uh, geospatial uh, capability. Abilities. Um, and so how we thought uh, maybe we can just crowdsource it on a shared map so that everybody can use the same map and pin uh, the availability on the map. And so um, this is, of course, very useful. And so that is why we need uh, to make sure that everybody has uh, enough um, like desire to get a medical mask, which is pretty much, much everybody can get so in a fair fashion, making sure that these numbers are accurate. Because if you rely only on people to report, then maybe on some hotspots, it will be uh, very close to uh, the real time um, numbers. But in the less populated areas, maybe you have numbers that are out of date uh, and which may actually add to the confusion, right? And so. We made sure that we work with the National Health Insurance um, Agency, uh, the NHIA, uh, which is um, a insurance single payer system that covers more than 99.99% of not just citizens, but also residents. Um, and the idea is that we refresh this information, which is a real time uh, mask stock level every 30 seconds, um, so that people queuing in line can help uh, keeping this system accountable. Like uh, if you're an adult nowadays, if you go to this pharmacy, uh, you can swipe your NHI card every two weeks and collect nine medical masks. And so uh, like with uh, 58 in stock, um, you would expect that it become like 49 uh, in the next uh, couple of minutes on this shared map. And if uh, people with like eyesight, um, disabilities and so on, with blindness and so on, there's also chatbots, voice assistants, and many other different ways to access the same information. And if you purchase a medical mask uh, and the people queuing after you, after a few minutes refresh, then see this number become not 49, but rather like 60. Uh, 70 or something, uh, they will call 1922 right there. Uh, and so mm -hmm. instead of placing the trust um, on the uh, top official, such as Minister Chen Shizhong, this is basically each pharmacist and each person in the queue uh, working together 
to keep this system honest and keep this system accountable and making sure that people who show any symptom would then be able to take the medical mask, go to a local clinic, knowing that they will get treated fairly without incurring any financial burden. Uh, and of course, one of the most popular chatbots called Ji Guan Jia, um, which is done by the Center for Disease Control in conjunction with HTC, Deep Q team uh, was a line bot. Uh, and it has uh, a uh, map, uh, interactive map there uh, that can uh, help the person navigate to the nearby pharmacies that still have um, mask in stock. And that chatbot uh, is really cool. So um, I think Lion is pretty good at extending its core functionality with uh, third-party uh, applications. And one of Thank those thir third-party uh, application uh, built by the civil society is this dashboard. And this dashboard shows, for example, that when we're ramping up the production from 2 million a day to 20 million a day, now the quota increased like from three uh, per week to nine per two weeks, and you actually see this growing uh, very quickly. And this is, um, as you can see, what people's uh, real-time responses uh, like demand and supply and so on. And so based on the real feedback from the pharmacist and also from those um, independent uh, analysis, we co-create our ordering system with the whole of society, changing the um, dispatch algorithm every week uh, in a very public fashion. And so based on this analysis, for example, we see that uh, only about 80% at most of people uh, have uh, access to this mask rationing system, meaning that there's about 20% of people who have never collected any mask from pharmacies. And so when we did an analysis based on the district, based on the county, mm -hmm. we found that these are the like science parks, like people who work very long hours and they often live um, by themselves, uh, like not with their family or extended family, so that uh, once they went off work, everybody uh, from the pharmacies have already uh, closed doors. And so mm -hmm. even though they have their uh, rationing, uh, they cannot actually collect those rationing. So it's obvious then that we need to work on uh, the 24 hours operating convenience stores, uh, such as 7-Eleven uh, and Family Mart and uh, High Life and OK Mart. Um, and so these uh, places become uh, what we call the mass collection uh, 2.0, in which case that you can pre-order on an app because these people who work in the science parks and so on, they um, are very familiar with mobile phone. So asking them to uh, pre-order their mask on a mobile phone, not a problem. And they can then collect it uh, in their nearby convenience store the next week, um, 24 hours a day. So you can see our premier uh, smiling very happily here. Uh, and that's because we start working with um, convenience stores. And because uh, after that, then we uh, analyze the numbers and there's still remain like 10% of people who uh, would not uh, use a app or mm -hmm. uh, go to a nearby pharmacy. And then there's some focus group uh, studies. And it turns out that there are, for example, migrant workers who are protected by the National Health uh, Insurance uh, app also, but because they don't have uh, the SIM card to their name, maybe they use mm -hmm. a prepaid SIM card or so on. So it's not that easy for them to use an app and they don't have the time to, to queue in line either. Uh, or if people who are like very old, uh, like the elderly uh, who don't live with their children, uh, then uh, of course they would not be able to queue so um, uh, in such a long queue, such a long time. Uh, and so maybe they would not uh, go and collect. So uh, for people who are migrant workers or like very old people, we eventually designed a um, mass 3.0, which is you just go to your nearby friendly convenience store using your um, NHI card, no apps required, and the kiosk will just validate your NHI card and you can just keep going to the same convenience store every uh, other week uh, and then uh, just pay um, a few uh, dollars uh, and then uh, collect uh, your uh, biweekly ration and there's no um, you know app installation or map or whatever uh, required and that um, closes the, the final gap of the final like 10% of people so there's uh, a lot of uh, evolution that ensures fairness of all kinds and finally uh, I would also like to stress that because this is a stressful time people do feel anxious there's a lot of panic buying a lot of conspiracy theories and in Taiwan our counter disinformation strategy uh, that we roll out way before the pandemic, but it's the idea of humor over rumor. Uh, and by humor over rumor, I mean that uh, when there ever there's rumor that travels on outrage, um, for example, there was a panic buying of tissue papers. There was a rumor that says, uh, quote, is the same material as facial mask because we're ramping up production of mask. Uh, we're going to run out of tissue papers soon, unquote. And so there was 
panic buying. And we know it's trending uh, because of the fact checking uh, community's uh, collaboration with Line. <laughs> so people can long press uh, the disinformation in the Line uh, community and forward it to the Taiwan Fact Check Center or Michael Pen or so on. So we see that this panic buy is trending. And so uh, within a couple of hours, the same premier you see smiling in the previous slide um, wrote this out on social media. And you can see that he shows his bottom, wiggling his bottom a little bit uh, and saying very large font that each of us only have one pair of Botox. Uh, it's a wordplay because in Mandarin, twin Botox sounds the same as stockpiling twin, right? So uh, there's no need to to twin because each of us only have a pair of twin, right? That, that's the idea. Uh, and so uh, it shows also a very clear table saying that the facial masks are produced using local materials. Uh, and the, um, so, uh, and the tissues are made out of South American materials, and these are different materials. Uh, and so there really is no need to panic. And this went absolutely viral. Uh, the package itself is a tissue paper package. Um, and so because of this, uh, the R value of this meme um, is higher than that of a conspiracy theory. Uh, and so you can see uh, that if you laugh about it, as you just did, actually, <laughs> you, you become vaccinated. Um, the same uh, outrage, uh, panic buying message, uh, if it gets to you, you will no longer share it, right? Because you're vaccinated uh, with fun. Uh, and so finally, we found out that, that uh, like three people who spread a rumor at the first place and they were tissue paper resellers. And anyway, they were persecuted. And so this is not just a single shot point in the social media. Every single daily press conference from the CECC gets translated by the spokesdog or Zong Chai uh, of the Ministry of Health and Welfare. And that translates, for example, physical distancing. If you're outdoor, please keep two dogs away. Indoor, please keep three dogs away. It's a very cute dog meme. Remember to cover your mouth and nose when sneezing. Remember to pre-order your mask. And why order your mask? Why wear a mask? Well, the mask protects you from your own uh, dirty and washed hands uh, from uh, touching your face, right? So this is uh, what we call yan jin chi shou shou, like, like don't um, uh, chew on your unwashed hand. It's hard to translate. But anyway, so all, all, this, all, all this makes sure that our humor, our factual humor spreads faster than rumor. And this is how the Taiwanese people still feel calm and collected even during the pandemic. And so if you want to learn more, uh, please feel free to visit Taiwan can help that us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the detailed sharing. I think we could learn a lot from that. I heard from other interviews that mm -hmm. for the first part, it's very interesting that uh, you and Howard never met each other before you built the uh, mass That's inventory right. we, we, system. We've never even video conferenced. Wow, yeah, really? Which was typed uh, on the chat channel. Yeah. Wow, and in two days, right? That's right. That's right. And uh, I think that's because he already has a prototype. All we had to do is to provide him uh, with the timely, like real time API of the mask in stock. Uh, and not only him, but also the Ji Guan Chia chatbot, the mm -hmm. HTC DeepQ team, um, and also another person, Fin Jian Kiang, uh, Jiang Min Zong, also from Tainan. Uh, they all work independently. Uh, fin Jian Kiang worked uh, already with like a water pollution level or air pollution level map. So he already had an interactive map. He just had to uh, change its data source and so on. So that's why it's so it's so quick uh, because uh, people have already prototyped the visualization part. We just made sure that the data pipeline worked. Wow, that's great. Thanks a lot for sharing. Mm -hmm. And I also uh, have, want to have your opinions about that. You have a favorite part about like everything, there's a crack in mm -hmm. it. And that's mm -hmm. where the light comes in. Okay. And from your speech that uh, I think mm -hmm. other countries could learn a lot from that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. If other countries would like to take the same measure, what could be done better mm -hmm. for the Tiber version? Mm -hmm. And you could like mm -hmm. provide suggestion to them. Mm -hmm. Well, South Korea already used Finchian Khan's map a month after uh, our mask availability map uh, online hackathon. Um, the civic technologists from South Korea managed to convince their government to publish the real-time API of mask availability availability. So that's great. Uh, and I think what, what works really well uh, is that if the pharmacist, uh, which works on the front line and is the main point of tension, but also of trust, uh, have a real-time feedback in Finjian Khan's um, map version, which is the 
uh, currently the primary version that people use, um, there's mm -hmm. a feedback form so that the uh, pharmacist can type in things that they want other people to to know, uh, like uh, a notice that says uh, we're handing out the number of plates, so please don't come uh, and collect your mask until we finished issuing out the number of plates, and that will be in the afternoon and so on. Uh, and if there's any like confusions uh, in terms of the mask rationing or the size of, um, for example, the children's mask and so on, uh, the pharmacist will also collect people's innovation, like how best uh, to solve that. Maybe it's with a 3D shaped mask that can fit uh, like like uh, even adults with small face or things like that. Uh, and they can all, all just uh, respond to it in real time. So this is uh, very important because there's no one size fits all algorithm. Uh, the distribution uh, mechanism, the size and so on, uh, all needs to be co-created. And once the pharmacists know that if they require a new feature, such as um, their opening hours or even pressing one key and disappearing from the web map and so on, uh, gets listened to and even like, uh, every week we iterate saying um, their input is taken into account, uh, then uh, the pharmacists are actually the most innovative bunch because they are uh, in the front lines. Uh, there's a, even a pharmacist uh, that using a, a card reader in a uh, PC uh, just rolled out a uh, automated dispensing uh, system uh, that uh, people can pay and swipe their NHI card and automatically get a token that they can then exchange uh, to medical masks. And then this is really good. And later on, I believe that also inspired the type of city, the smart city uh, project management office to work with the vending machine uh, company called YoVent uh, to do the vending machine like self-service uh, mass dispensing, uh, like a, a robotic pharmacy uh, of sorts and inspired by the pharmacist's work. And so I think the open innovation is the most important thing. And uh, if there is a crack uh, in everything as, as there were, um, that's how the light gets in. If you uh, make sure that everybody who innovate and thinks of a good idea, have a toll-free number to call have a feedback form that can escalate to the top of the command chain. Then uh, the, com the commander chain, uh, Chen Shizhong in Taiwan, always have this attitude saying, oh, you should have told me sooner. Uh, let's learn about this together, and so on. So he's not a top-down commander, right? So he's working mm -hmm. with people, not just for the people. That is really great. Thank you very much. And I'd like to have another question about like in this crisis, uh, you mentioned about like, like different parties have different roles and what role should the communication platform or SSS to play in this crisis? And do you have other like expectation to line? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Line uh, was very uh, helpful in helping us to identify the trending panic buying, the trending rumors, and so on. So this long press to report uh, this information, I think just like an email vendor would say, you know, a click clear to flag something as spam. Uh, that's that's very useful. And I understand that the CSR team in Line Taiwan uh, worked very hard on it because there was nothing like it in other jurisdictions. <laughs> For, uh, but once the Line CSR Taiwan team built that I understand like people from the uh, Jia Rong Gong University in Thailand uh, really wanted to learn that and they even copied the Cofact uh, innovation from GovZero into the Thai version and working with the uh, line in Thailand which is also a very popular uh, messaging tool. So I think just work closely with civic technologists and making sure that the platform itself uh, stays um, open to new innovations such as Cofax or in the Taiwan the Trend Micro right antivirus company has this doctor message that detects not only rumors and disinformation, but also uh, scams uh, like video scams and picture scams and so on. And that's also very helpful. And so, yeah, if Line works uh, closely with the civic technologist in the open, like making sure that people who have a better idea is not hindered uh, by the platform, uh, then I think uh, that is really good uh, social responsibility. Thank you very much. I think the work closely will be the key to the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's another question about the COVID-19 as well. So now mm -hmm. the COVID-19, we know that it changed our daily life a lot. And Line actually published a press release. And mm -hmm. it shows that from our users, they increased the group chat to 30, uh, increased by 347 after the COVID-19 outbreak. Mm -hmm. So question would like to broaden a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like how would you think about the work style or even that mm -hmm. user's daily life will change how people interaction in the future one year or even mm -hmm. 10 years. Mm 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think um, just as uh, Line, you know, rolled out screen sharing <laughs> during the pandemic uh, in the for the desktop version, uh, I think um, really real time messaging, including screen sharing, is now becoming a commodity. Uh, like mm-hmm. uh, people just open a browser and expect. Uh, for example, we're using StreamYard. It doesn't require any installation of, of anything. It, it just works, right? Uh, and, and so that will become um, like commodity as in it's just part and parcel uh, of the work. And this is good because prior to that, we had people uh, maybe more senior uh, in the upper management level and their previous experience with video conferencing was really bad. Maybe they have uh, like a laggy microphone or uh, maybe the uh, like screen resolution is bad or uh, if the installation takes a lot of time, maybe there's cybersecurity concern. I can go on, right? Uh, and uh, mm-hmm. by now, the, the COVID convinced pretty much everybody that, uh, no, you don't have to install anything, right? You just pop into this browser and then you can start a video conference together. Uh, and so then uh, we get to meet with people who are a lot more uh, frequent users, like the senior officers are, are now seeing, oh, actually it is, um, you can see each other's expressions pretty well um, over the screen uh, and certainly better than if you have to wear a mask. So it, uh, <laughs> it's better than face-to-face conversation <laughs> that you had to wear a mask. Uh, and so I think that's great. Uh, and because of that, then we are now seeing that uh, in many teams, uh, whereas there was you know, a lot of like all hands meetings or very mm-hmm. uh, large groups, um, people are now uh, working more in satellite groups, like three to five people, maybe just in a co-working space. Um, in my office in the Social Innovation Lab, there's this outdoor space with just chairs that's exactly one meters apart. That's two dogs apart, uh, making sure that social distancing uh, is kept so people don't have to wear a mask and they can join uh, via teleconferencing uh, with uh, pretty much anywhere else in Taiwan because we have broadband as human rights. And with the 5G deployment, we can then take this co-presencing uh, even into the most rural areas and even into you know uh, near the ocean and so on. And, and that will then allow people to interact uh, with each other in a much more closely knit fashion while understanding uh, that they don't have to be physically in the same space. And so I think the technology is here to support the society uh, migrating into a place where uh, people work closely with just a few people and they when they want to feel proximity they can always step into co-presence using augmented reality or um, just regular video conferencing or even audio only audio scape um, video conferencing and audio uh, conferencing these are all really uh, mature technologies now um, and so that's for the next one year uh, in in 10 years uh, I, I think um, in 10 years, what we will then learn is that most of the educational needs and most of the um, like healthcare needs and so on, uh, like currently only the top like surgery using the Da Vinci mm-hmm. machine and things like that are uh, designed for like telesurgery and so on. But in 10 years, I think we'll gradually see uh, that because the co-presence technology is so good. Uh, mostly, uh, if you summon a doctor, <laughs> that will have the same experience, even a better experience uh, than if you uh, walk to the hospital or to the clinics. Mm-hmm. And the same um, holds true for schools and teachers uh, as well. And, and so internet as a co-presence place uh, will uh, augment the face-to-face conversations uh, even more. And I think I really look forward to that because that's how we can do place making uh, together in a most uh, effective way. Wow, well, very, very look forward to the future you mentioned. Mm-hmm. I'm also wondering that uh, how about the communication for the language? I read mm-hmm. an article that your favorite book is the dictionaries yeah. with different mm-hmm. languages. Yeah. And for the interaction generally, we will consider about not only the local interaction, but also the global communication. Sure. So mm-hmm. how would you think about in, and envision about the language will change in the future? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, a lot of uh, the things about language acquisition, learning a new language, which is just immersing uh, in a new culture. And so the co-presencing technologies, for example, just uh, projecting oneself into a uh, indigenous nation and working with the indigenous people together uh, is now made much more possible using broadband as a human right and also augmented reality. That's how Taiwan can support our more than 20 national languages because we can't bring the indigenous language teachers practically to all the primary schools. Uh, But because of the National Language Act, anyone who wants to learn about any indigenous language have the right to do so. So what we do is that they join this co-presencing 
uh, virtual reality uh, and the indigenous teachers in a kind of green screen room uh, just records their interaction uh, in this virtual reality so that people can feel that they're in the same uh, language circle together. Uh, and so I, I think this really is a, a good idea of uh, people immersing themselves in the culture, relying mm -hmm. uh, initially on machine translation to get their ideas across, but then uh, they build common memories and that they can associate these uh, with those um, unique words uh, to that culture so that people can understand new concepts that previously was not uh, expressible uh, in their original language. And so they can look at their original culture from the perspective that their new acquired culture that's called transculturalism. And I think this is also very important. Oh, thank you very much. And I also want to uh, have another question about the open data. I think this is another important topic because you have mentioned so many times in different interviews that you propose about the open information and also discomfort for the discomfort information. So how, how do you define the ideal situation of open and mm. what do you think about the benefits of, of open what could bring to the society? Mm, and why yeah. you feel it as a very high priority uh, in mm. front, between so many issues? So open means uh, that anyone can freely access to use, to modify and share for any purpose. And, and that's the open definition. It's actually, I'm just reading from opendefinition.org. <laughs> uh, so why, why is it important um, so that uh, both data and content can be freely used, modified, and shared by anyone for any purpose? It's because the, the knowledge um, in anyone's mind uh, is just one perspective into a structural mm -hmm. problem. And we're uh, looking at the most global structural problems now. For example, as you mentioned, disinformation, for example, the pandemic itself, climate change, right? All, all these issues uh, are structural in the sense that there's no single solution that can solve it. If there's a single quick solution, we would have solved it by now, but, but <laughs> it requires coordinated um, action from people from all the different uh, sides. And because of that, um, if we do not share uh, the facts, uh, that is what data means, uh, that people are working on. We're essentially uh, working on different versions of reality. Uh, and so our innovations would not be con commensurable, meaning that if I innovate, but I don't share the factual basis on which I innovate, then you have no way to see or to check whether this works for your situation or not. So you will then be forced uh, to uh, you know, invent by, by yourself, uh, like we say, invent um, a, a car out of you know, closed door blueprints like beam and you. Uh, but uh, what we're advocating is that you need to share the blueprints like exactly which um, requirements are you looking at for, for the car and even before you manufacture the first one so that people uh, who specialize in wheels, who specialize in steering wheels, who uh, specialize in uh, the engine and so on, uh, they can all do their part and those, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, literally. And so I think just getting people on the same reality, making sure that we have the same factual basis to tackle global structural issues. That's the importance and the urgency of working in the open. Wow. Uh, I'm also curious about an extend question. So you mentioned about the open is to have the facts to everyone. So if we have so many facts, how could we prioritize about like which is the most important to proceed well you can rely on each other right the collective intelligence why would people notice there's seven new SARS cases uh, in Wuhan as reported by Liu Wenliang and reposted to PTT it's by upvoting uh, and so upvoting is a decentralized way so that people who see something that's more interesting they can upvote it so that it gets more people's attention if it doesn't warrant that attention people will downvote it and then you won't see it again but if people see that uh, it really is uh, factual and the fact really contribute to our collective understanding, then uh, on PTT it gets upvoted very quickly so that it will explode. Uh, and once it explodes, uh, it will really have an explosion um, letter uh, next to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then people will notice it uh, very quickly. And so uh, if you compare that to only a few people get to moderate, then if those people made the wrong judgment, for example, Dr. Li Wenliang certainly uh, try also to share on the PRC social 
social media, but the people who moderate the content there uh, saw this and say that it's counterfactual, uh, at least at the beginning. Uh, and so it got harmonized, that is to say, uh, taken down uh, from the social media circulation. Uh, but I, I'm sure that these people are not uh, meaning to, to hurt people in Wuhan. Uh, it's just mm -hmm. they maybe have some content guidelines and it doesn't fit their content guidelines and so on. Like maybe they thought it would cause mass panic. Uh, but then uh, because the power to censor, to moderate, uh, is not democratic, it's centralized. When it makes a uh, mistake, like in the Li Wenliang case, uh, then everybody pays um, the cost. Uh, but in Taiwan, when it's uh, decentralized and everybody can help moderate, eventually uh, people who specialize, for example, uh, in epidemiology would say, oh, I think these numbers make sense. It looks like it's mm -hmm. coming from a real machine and things like that, so that people with different expertise uh, can add in their rationale for upvoting. Uh, like on PTT, usually the fifth commenter uh, is the most professional, right? The professional fifth floor, Zhang uh, Yi的五楼, and then. Uh, people will then be able to collaborate on the fact uh, part, which is a little bit like journalism, where everybody just contribute a little bit uh, to the collective information. I like the idea you mentioned about the decentralized and rely on each others. Also, uh, would like to know that about the overall open data, sometimes it might also invite the privacy invasions of the fear. So I think there is always a fine balance between the convenience and risk. How could you uh, could you also share us about the fine balance and how could mm -hmm. we strike the balance of that? Well, I think the, the values are the same, right? We all agree that privacy is important. Yes. And we yes. all agree that uh, if it's more convenient to use, then uh, people are more likely uh, to work with technology instead of against technology. So uh, I really don't think there's a, a value difference here. Uh, what we think uh, is important, as I have con um, actually conveyed that uh, to Line, uh, for example, like uh, many, many years ago, Line uh, only encrypts end-to-end -end, uh, like two people connections, but on the group, uh, it was not end-to-end -end encrypted. And, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they use the, the same um, user interface so that people don't know that on the one side it's end-to-end -end encrypted, and on the other side it really is not. It's only encrypted in transit, but not in storage. Uh, and I uh, talked to, to Line uh, saying that I think this is very confusing. Um, and so, uh, of course, then Line introduced this uh, envelope uh, you know, group scheme so that even in chat groups, uh, things are still end-to-end -end encrypted. And if you get a new device, of course, you don't get to see the Logs then, um, unless you do an export import. Uh, so in any case, um, I think that's that's a of course slightly less convenient. I think many of your customers would prefer to see the full log. But you explain it really, really simply, saying that for end-to-end -end encryption to work, uh, we must not keep a copy of your chat log. And if we don't have a chat copy of your chat log, and you lose access to all your devices, uh, once you recover, of course, you don't get to have the log because <laughs> we don't have it either, right? Um, and so I think uh, as long as it's accountable, meaning that you can provide a full explanation of why it's mm -hmm. like that, um, then I think the users of Line eventually saw that, oh, really, yeah, it's to protect our own privacy. Uh, and they don't mind that they don't have access to the logs uh, that much anymore, right? So, so I think um, accountability is really the the thing that connects uh, the convenience uh, and the privacy uh, together, uh, making sure that people understand the trade offs they're making. Why Line uh, chooses this particular way of end to end encryption for for group chats, uh, and then eventually saying, you know, if you want to keep something to yourself, you can also forward it to, to line keep, uh, in which case <laughs> it's no it's no longer end to end encrypted because there's only one end, right? And and things like that. And and this is important because then uh, all the different use cases can be innovated by your uh, users without the government uh, coming out and saying, um, you know, uh, you're falsely advertising. What line has been doing is that they, uh, well, you <laughs> advertise very clearly. Uh, and if you say, <laughs> You know, uh, we will know uh, which stickers you use. That's not end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, you you go forward and say that's because we're selling the stickers <laughs> and things like that, right? So so I think this is um, important to give a full accountability so that people with different trade-offs, they can change their settings and so on. And the default, if it's always uh, accountable, then I think the government can safely stay out of most conversations. But if it's not accountable, then I think really it's the government's role to make sure that all the technology companies can provide this kind of full account to its users. 
Wow, thank you very much. Well, actually, now we have, this is the last question, but if we have more time, maybe we could have others questions from liners mm -hmm. like to ask. Mm -hmm. So uh, could you also share about your version of Steve Jobs commencement state address? And also some mm -hmm. liners would like to have your comments from you mm -hmm. to know if they want to uh, be like you, what would mm -hmm. you say to them? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, um, so uh, by my version, do you mean that uh, I just read Steve Jobs' commencement address? Like, uh, <laughs> like um, maybe a like, quick, quick uh, version. Hungry, stay foolish. I've always wished that for myself, and now as you graduate to begin a new, I wish that for you. Stay hungry and stay foolish. Uh, is that what you want? And maybe to make my acoustic model or something. <laughs> I think it may be for some uh, life story, but it's fine if you uh, mm -hmm. are okay with that. But how yeah. about the next mm -hmm. one about the yeah. liners, uh, some mm -hmm. advice to liners? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I think, um, as I often quote Leonard Cohen, my favorite poet, uh, the idea uh, that um, ring the bells that still can ring and forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. Uh, this is very important because um, anyone ha has dreams, but only if we dream together, if we have the common values, the common goals, uh, can we uh, look through uh, each other's uh, difficulties and gaps and cracks and become lights uh, that can then um, go through the existing uh, inequalities, injustices, and things like that. So I would say that um, don't be too perfect because if you have a perfect offering, actually you don't have uh, people who help you. Uh, you will then uh, only be able to solve things that are not very big uh, structured, but rather very specific and narrow uh, because only these specific and narrow things can be done to a perfection. If you want to solve real world problems, there's no perfect solution. And as uh, Ward Cunningham's law says, um, there's no easier way to get people to help you than to give a really bad solution. Uh, and then people who uh, feel offended by this, uh, you know, unprofessionalism uh, will then uh, really come out and contribute uh, to your work. Uh, and so, yeah, be, be I guess, imperfect uh, and also be open so that when people point out your imperfections, invite them and you become the most uh, fellows. Uh, working on the same goals and same problems. Wow, that is really great. Thank you very much for the message. So uh, since we still have some time, could I proceed with other questions as well? Yeah, of course. We have like okay. 10 more minutes. Yeah. Yes. OK, mm -hmm. thank you. So uh, some liners are curious about your uh, politics uh, regarding questions. Mm -hmm. So before like 2020, you were an entrepreneur. And mm -hmm. after that, you joined the uh, God, uh, Zero mm -hmm. and become mm -hmm. the politician. What right. is the reason you decided mm -hmm. to become a politician? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm still an entrepreneur. I, I guess I'm now an intrapreneur, uh, as in I'm starting my own startup within the executive UN uh, and called the Public Digital Innovation Space, or PDIS. Uh, and also I'm a slashy, meaning that I'm also running other startups uh, like the Radical Exchange uh, with uh, Vitalik Buterin and, and Daniel Allen and Glenn Weil in New York, uh, and also Digital Future Society in Barcelona, and also Council Democracy Foundation in Amsterdam, and so on. So uh, the digital minister is really just my day job. Uh, I'm still <laughs> doing a lot of entrepreneurship. Uh, and so um, the, the reason why I saw that the uh, public digital innovation space is a good space for entrepreneurship uh, comes from the 2014 Occupy, when we helped uh, the occupiers who occupied the parliament in 2014 um, to do consultations and uh, public deliberation on the street. We saw that um, many career public service uh, people in the bureaucracy actually prefer this mode of direct conversation with the people. They also don't like uh, having to go through, um, you know, elected officials or uh, politicians or representatives. Uh, and because the career public service is actually very innovative, they also crave this kind of direct conversation uh, with the people who are closest to the pain, that is to say the stakeholders of public policy. All they uh, wanted is a way to peacefully conduct such consultations so that they're signal instead of just noise, right? So um, the Occupy uh, Parliament uh, movement 
produced um, a few consensus. And one of them uh, is to establish a online deliberation uh, participation platform called join.gov.tw um, that people can review each and every new regulation for 60 days uh, in the drafting stage, each and every budget items and mid to long term government projects. Mm -hmm petitions that people can start who collect 5,000 signature and demand a ministerial or even cross-ministerial collaborative response and things like that. So that instead of occupying the parliament for each uh, political issue, <laughs> we, we can just use the internet um, to come to rough consensus. And so uh, I think because the Korea Public Service really liked the idea, I started to work uh, with the HR department to train mm -hmm. the Korea Public Service in the arts of public consultation. I think I personally trained around 1,000 people or so wow. uh, with, with many other facilitators uh, who work in the Occupy uh, from uh, 14 to 15. And, and so when the cabinet invites me to be the digital minister in 16, I said, but you, you see, um, they, they uh, take advices from me, but I'm not ordering anyone to do anything. I think the career public service really need to be the uh, protagonist uh, in public sector innovation. And uh, the Premier Lin Chun said, okay, of course, why not? Right, so, so that's why I'm a minister uh, I call myself a small uh, lowercase minister, as you're using in your question. That's great. A lowercase digital minister means that I preach and advocate about digital transformation, but I'm not a uppercase minister uh, that uh, issues orders and unilateral commands. And so my main work, I, I would say, is a poetician uh, that is to say changing uh, people's uh, ideas about digital only as information communication technology, but for, into a digital as a new like in Japan, uh, Japan says uh, society 5.0, right? A new uh, way for the society to work together. So that's uh, literally my job description, uh, which you can bring um, to the screen if you, uh, yes. Uh, so my job description reads uh, like this. When we see the internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. And when we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. So that's my vision. Oh, that is really nice. Thanks for sharing. And another two questions. Uh, it's about the digital society. So how can we improve data literacy uh, for becoming a digital society? So it might involve in three aspects, like the uh, government for politicians and for the enterprise and also to the general users level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't. Don't improve data literacy. <laughs> uh, because data literacy or media literacy, I think that's where the term came from, right? Just um, uh, like people need to become literate uh, in data mm -hmm. and in media. Um, it just assumes that people are consumers that they only consume data or consume media, consume digital creativity works. And there's a two classes, people one create and one consume, but the one who creates one need the consumer to become literate so they can more appreciate uh, the creators of uh, media and, and data. But, but that's, uh, I think, a, a very um, radio and television um, mm -hmm. style view because truly with radio and television, only a few people can make television shows. Only a few people are broadcasters um, on the radio stations because there's only so much spectrum, right? In a AM and FM radio, and so by necessity, there's only a few uh, people who can create and most people need only to liter be literate. But nowadays you don't need a AM or FM bond, right? You just need a mm -hmm. podcast account uh, and everybody <laughs> is a podcaster, right? right? You, you don't need uh, your own cable channel. Anyone is a YouTuber in Taiwan because broadband is a human right. Anywhere in Taiwan, you're guaranteed to have 10 megabits per second, unlimited data connection at only 16 US dollars um, per month. Otherwise it's my fault, right? So because of that anyone with a phone can just become a YouTuber uh, very quickly. And so when everybody produces data and produces media, 
the thing to teach is not literacy anymore, right? Uh, it's competency. Uh, it's making sure that people feel the responsibility of essentially being a journalist, uh, being a media producer, and the fact checking that they need to be aware of the framing effect of the social responsibility. And people who produce data, for example, measuring their air quality or water quality or whatever, and contributing it to the society or making sure that they are stewards of data, like each mm -hmm. pharmacist uh, is a steward of the mask availability for the pharmacy. But each person queuing in line is also a collaborator in the collaborative because they keep the steward honest, right? So, so all okay. this is a co-production, co-creation relationship. Uh, and so, if people have like um, like every day contribute. Um, a few minutes uh, into data stewardship, uh, either by maintaining their local airbox stations uh, or by if they have plenty of masks and not collecting it, they can dedicate their uncollected mask quota on the app to international humanitarian aid, right, uh, including uh, to, to Japan. Uh, and so this is also a, a data collaborative where we uh, essentially encourage people to anonymously or put their name on it and curate this data set of uh, what we are ready to donate uh, to the nurses and doctors, uh, to the world, and so on. And so by participating in curation of data, people will then understand the things that are impossible to teach without first-hand experience, including what does it mean uh, to, uh, you know, do data um, uh, collaboratives? How do the incentives work? Um, data controllership. Uh, when we say accountability, that is to say when mm -hmm. people complain that data quality is bad, what does accountability mean? Uh, if you're a data producer, you will also worry about uh, if people entrust their data to you, your personal data, uh, how would you protect those? Uh, how would you make it portable? Uh, and things like that. But if you have never been to uh, a place where you are a data steward, none of these uh, ideas make sense um, to, to people, right? Just as when people never used uh, as a uh, camera to to, to film some, I don't know, YouTube or home videos or things like that. Uh, many of the newsroom, like Journalism 101, wouldn't make sense because people have not uh, been behind the camera. They have uh, only been watching things from a television. Uh, and so in our K-12 curriculum, we make sure that digital competence, media competence, um, is part of our K-12 K curriculum. And in each and every uh, discipline, each and every class, they teach that by having the teacher not as a, a holder of the standardized answers by encouraging uh, all the children to produce their own interpretation of the world and to curate the data together. And so I think that answer for the citizens. Um, and so for the enterprise, I think what's most important is to work with the people and sometime mm -hmm. after the people. We talk about how LINE uh, allows for chatbot-based open innovation, um, about how LINE, instead of censoring uh, messages, uh, just rely on people to flag something as spam and things like that. So for an enterprise, the more you can co-create with your users, uh, the more uh, open you are uh, in the landscape of innovation. Uh, and that, in turn, helps everybody to be more um, digitally competent, including data competence. And the same, I think, holds for politicians. If the politicians who uh, work for the maximum benefit of people can also mm -hmm. share whatever dashboard that we're looking at to make decisions, or even better, um, you know, have the civil society make the dashboard and we just use the dashboards. Uh, and that's reverse procurement and that's work with the collective intelligence and that's no longer working for the people. It's not even with the people, it's working after the people. That's, I think, uh, even more important in the future. Well, thank you very much. I think you also answered the question for yeah, it, exactly. is that if people yeah. yes. work with <laughs> each other, then people can could voice That's their right. opinions. Re reverse procurement, reverse mentorship, uh, collective intelligence, crowd law, data collaborative, sandboxes, presidential hackers, and all these are the ways that we uh, make sure that there's a grassroots decision-making process. Well, that's really nice. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I have the last question from Liners. So uh, in Japan, mm -hmm. some younger people in general, they don't particip participate in elections. So one proposal mm -hmm. is that to have the online elections. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what do you think about that idea? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think uh, you can start with not uh, electing people, but rather participatory budgeting. 
uh, or uh, some small scale uh, referenda uh, or citizens uh, assembly and things like that. And the reason is if you're electing for people, then uh, there's this uh, exponential reward, right? <laughs> if you game the system once, you can get a person who then uh, change the system uh, for you. Uh, but if you're just setting the priorities, for example, in Taiwan, we have national referenda uh, every two years, but uh, each referendum is only binding for two years. Uh, and so we can keep doing the same deliberation uh, again and again uh, as the international uh, situation changes and so on. But if you're just electing a person, then of course that's mm -hmm. mutually exclusive. We can not have the same person, uh, you know, serving uh, at once, uh, right, as a uh, mayor, uh, and then uh, for some other person to also serve as a mayor to to try both them out. That doesn't work. So I would say that online voting uh, is great, but it would be better to start uh, if you vote more frequently. If you don't change the frequency, uh, I really don't think that younger people will be attracted uh, much more because at the end it's just three bits every four years uploaded, mm -hmm. uh, and they have much more uh, fruitful um, places for real-time interaction. So again, I think this toll-free number, like 1922, that's very useful because every time you call it, not only you immediately um, get a response, but also your good idea in a day or a week just become the CECC uh, public amplified uh, response. And that uh, short response cycle at which like our e-petition platform where you can join like 10 petitions at once, I think that is much more useful for younger people and also elderly alike. Wow, thank you very much. And thanks a lot for sharing the uh, your opinions about different important topics. Mm -hmm. As mm -hmm. our time is still close up, I think mm -hmm. um, thank you very much again. And mm -hmm. I would like to uh, close the interview today. Okay, thank you. Uh, and live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. Yeah, okay, bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>